Uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, this is E180's very first Learn Out Loud uh, group brain day conversation. Essentially, it's a discussion that we're going to have among experts and people who are working in different fields. Um, and the purpose of this series and this initiative is to really explore collaborative learning in all its forms. So we're, we're going to pick and choose from different topics and, and really explore what that means. Um, our company does peer-to-peer -peer learning, uh, and that's a core principle that we have, the many teaching the one as opposed to the one teaching the many. Um, today's topic of conversation is storytelling strategies and tactics to engage communities. Uh, and that can be broad, and you'll see that I think we're going to go in a lot of different directions. Um, we're going to have our conversation uh, and open it up to questions around 12.45 p.m. Eastern time. And after that, we'll uh, wrap it up with some takeaways. Um, I thought we would quickly start by introducing ourselves. Um, so sharing maybe our name, uh, where we're located, what we do, and the first thing that comes to mind when we talk storytelling. And so I'll start. Uh, my name is Gabe Gabriel. I'm based in Toronto. I work as a learning experience designer for E180. And the first thing that comes to mind is reading stories to my new son, or it makes me think back to when my parents read stories to me. Uh, he doesn't understand words at the moment, but I'm thrilled at the possibility <laughs> of a time when we can share those moments together. Uh, and I will pass it to Gabriel because we share the name and that's convenient. <laughs> uh, thank you, uh, Gabe. Uh, so yeah, my name is Gabriel, and uh, I'm the founder of GY Consulting. It's a boutique uh, consulting firm, uh, mainly focused in strategy, innovation, and leadership, and designing you know workshops of all sorts, and specifically around uh, Lego series play methodology and materials. So uh, the first thing that comes to mind when I think about storytelling is being in the zone, because when you let yourself go and you have no sense of self, no sense of time, no sense of anything other than a story unfolding itself, that's being in the zone for me. Mm. And so I'll pass it on to uh, Marcy. Yes, thanks, Gabriel, thanks. Um, very excited to be here. Thank you so much, uh, Gabe and Sriti. Um, so my name is Marcy Fortnow and I'm in Chicago. Uh, in the US and um, my company is called Engaging Play. And uh, I work with leaders and managers who have teams and their teams that are not communicating well. So I focus on collaboration, connection, community building, and all to help teams work better together, communicate better, and so they can get more done, right? On time, on budget, whatever that is. And um, <clears throat> When I think about storytelling, um, I think about connection. And that's the big thing for me because it helps people to connect. They might see themselves in a story or they might learn more about the other person through the story that they're hearing. And that level of connection is really powerful and needed, right? So that's my thing. So um, I'll pass it to Mary. Marcy, and you stole my answer. I was going to say the same thing. So <laughs> now I'll have to come up with my second or third, but um, mm. my name's Mary Ayers. I'm based in Napa, California. Um, I work for an organization, New Tech Network. We're an education design partner in the K-12 um, education space here in the U.S. So we partner with schools and school districts to help them sort of redesign and rethink and reimagine teaching and learning. Um, it's a journey that we go on with them for Schools can be with us up to four to 10 plus years in our network. So we have a really nice network of schools and um, educators. And I lead a team of event designers and our work is around um, creating engaging and collaborative learning experiences, professional development for teachers, for school leaders, for district leaders. Um, it's really amazing work that we get to do. And the thing that I think about with storytelling other than connection is that sort of shared history that it can bring out when you're sharing a story, um, even if it's not something that somebody directly experienced, if it's a story that you're telling from your own past, the way that you can connect through sometimes a shared history that gets uncovered through story is really pretty amazing. Um, so I'll pass it to, and I 
forgive me if I mispronounce your name. Smriti. Smriti. Yeah. Oh, excellent. <laughs> All right. Thanks. Thanks, Mary. Um, oh my God. This is the, this is the burden of going lost because all the good answers are already taken. Uh, but I think that um, my, the first thing that comes to mind when I think about storytelling, it's very related to what both you, Mary and Marcy said, uh, because the word that comes to mind for me is empathy. I think that what, um, you know, leads to that connection, uh, what also leads to that experiencing of the shared past and what makes storytelling such a powerful form of communication is the fact that it bridges the empathy gap. You know, if you if you tell a story, especially if you tell a story well, um, you are placing someone in your own shoes. You know, for a minute you get to, you know, see the world through somebody else's eyes. Um, you get to feel as they do and, it's it's so powerful and it's what we need right now and like every aspect of our lives um so yeah that's for me empathy that's the one yeah so Gabe how do you what do you think about our answers <laughs> I, I love them I feel like mine was the simplest and most superficial and I'm so no. pleased that you followed <laughs> it was a but I think you know the the what yeah. comes to mind when I think about the storytelling to my son is those moments that, yeah. that sharing of a bond that creating of a narrative <laughs> that's gonna continue you know over decades and grow and change our relationship uh you know also sharing right it's not only about reading stories, but it's uh, reading stories, sharing stories that I grew up with, mm -hmm. that I love, that impacted me. Um, so so I think that's that's the thing about it, right? It, it goes through time as well as space uh, and mm. can really sort of pierce barriers or walls that we, that we, we have between ourselves, either you know, as individuals or, or larger groups or communities. Um, I was wondering, if you can speak a bit, uh, Mary, maybe you want to start with this. Uh, and I don't want to follow through a, like a, a form of like interviewer questions. So maybe we'll, <laughs> this will kind of initiate a conversation. Uh, is how you feel that you're applying uh, storytelling in your work uh, at New Tech Network and within the event space um, yeah. that you're working in? Yeah, I was thinking about that um, when this topic came up. And, you know, storytelling is just such a natural part of how we interact and how we talk, um, the kinds of relationships that we build, the empathy that we try to build when we are especially bringing in a new school and a new team. Um, I think it's really important for storytelling in our work to help kind of connect when a, when a new school is coming on board with us, when they're starting their journey with us. You know, there's so many questions that they have. And I think that by telling the story, and if we bring in teachers that maybe have gone through this process before and are part of our network, for them to share their story of how it felt to start on this journey and how mm -hmm. to rethink how they're teaching, it breaks down the barrier of, well, you're the instructor of this training program and I'm just the student. It really helps sort of level that field and create a connection that then lasts for a very long time as those people go through, you know, their first initial implementation and work with us. Um, so I've just seen it time and again, whether it's you're talking five people in a room or 1500 people in a big ballroom or virtual, it's, you know, that ability to connect is really what makes, um, you know, some pretty challenging and difficult work makes it a little bit easier, especially this last year with COVID. I mean, it's just been, you know, to get people in a room, a virtual room, just to talk and share mm -hmm. their story like this is does so much for the soul and just helps people get through. So mm -hmm. that's how we've employed it. And it's, it's like I said, it's not even anything that we even think about. It's just like, well, we start with the story and then connect back to it and then, you know, get finally to whatever it is that we're trying to get through, like a framework or, you know, a module or protocol or something like that. So, yeah. Yeah. I, I, I really loved, um, you know, your kind of response to Gabe's question, because uh, one of the things that often just, um, it frustrates me about a lot about conversations with storytelling is that oftentimes it's so, it feels very kind of opaque and ambiguous because it has become, uh, you know, such a buzzword as I'm sure everyone in this conversation can agree. But I, I love that, you know, Mary, like you're using this uh, in this like very concrete way, right? Like even if it, if it even if it is something that feels kind of very natural and organic, mm -hmm. um, 
you're using it as a way, you know, to almost break the ice, but not in like a, because there are so many icebreakers, especially in the virtual setting. Yeah. Um, there you, you can find lists of like icebreakers of getting people to kind of relate with each other. And the virtual setting is mm -hmm. not naturally a very warm one. And so it really is like a, it's a concrete way of making the virtual space at the very least, you know, a little bit friendlier, um, mm -hmm. starting off an event with like a little bit of vulnerability. Yes. Um, yes. Yeah. And so I would love to hear from both of you, Marcy um, yeah. and Gabriel, as well as like, how are you using storytelling in your work as well? So I, I just wanted to also add that I think I use it also as an engagement tool, right? Mm -hmm. If I'm trying yeah. to make things, especially in this virtual space, right, more engaging, um, not only that it's entertaining, uh, that mm -hmm. people, but but it helps people engage with the content or or move towards what you want them to move towards. So um, it's a huge engagement tool. And I think about how I might use it um, to teach. So um, definitely adding the warmth, but I would add that that it helps people connect to the topic, right? So, you know, if you're, if you're using a problem solution anchor sort of model, right, in teaching, you can tell a story about the problem to really have people understand what is it we're really talking about? What is the thing that we're really talking about um, so that when you start talking about the solution and maybe give that a story, there's more connection to it, right? And, and, um, and it definitely empowers learning and um, to the content as well. And, and I love how it creates just a different kind of engagement, right? You know, you might implement polls and mm. and chat and all sorts of little engagement tools in the in the virtual space but but storytelling whether you're the one doing it or you're asking other people to do it right mm -hmm. you know think of a time when or mm -hmm. you know how how might you or pair sharing or whatever it is um it helps that kind of content connection mm -hmm. marcy do you see it also like if you've got somebody that might be a little resistant to what you're trying to do, maybe they're, you know, they're the holdout in whether it's uh, the training, whether you're trying to get, you know, get a group to like move towards a different solution. That person's kind of a holdout. It's a way to sort of break down that almost coming in like through the back door where they stumble upon like, Oh, Oh, so that's what, right. I get it now what you're trying to do. It, it's sort of, uh, it's a, a low risk way of getting somebody to buy into or maybe not buy into, but see your point of view in that way. Right. Yeah. And asking people to tell their own story mm -hmm. is hugely powerful, right? Not only me telling you something, but Absolutely. getting you to tell my, your story. Absolutely. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. I, I, I appreciate very much what you said, Mary and Marcy about it. But there's one word also that uh, Smriti mentioned, which is vulnerability. Mm -hmm. and, and I think this is this is really the facade that we that I I know as when I use storytelling in my work uh, is the facade, the first layer that I want to break down. Because when we work in a Zoom environment or by distance, it it feels for me as if uh, you know, people become more formal. Uh, they, they, you know, they, how they show up, how do they look in their screen? And, and then after that, when they have to start sharing stories and they're like, oh my God, now what am I going to say? Whatever. So all of this is the first element for me that, uh, you know, I try to use storytelling as the first element to break down that, to, uh, to show the vulnerability and break down the facade of showing up as a true person, a true individual. Yeah. And uh, it's interesting because it's connection with deed, it's, it's, you know, it's a shared, you know, history and all of that. Uh, but one of the things I've also, I may add to that is, is it takes two, right? It takes a giver and a receiver. And how do you actually find that connection? And I think it's, right. it's, for me, it's always been the challenge, but one of the things that I've discovered is that it has to come from the heart. The storytelling is, has to come from the heart. You know, Gabe, when you're, you're sharing your story with your kid, you're not sharing I, I'm suspecting that you're, you're not sharing it because you want the kid to absorb information and get to learn about certain things, right? You're doing it, you know, sending out a certain energy and a certain love to your kid. And, and I think storytelling has to stay rooted in that element of being heart-centered. Mm -hmm. uh, 
one of the things that I've, I've come to realize when I do a lot of uh, workshop design workshop, the first thing I try to do is, is just show up as myself and, 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 and showing up as myself is, is saying, telling a story, whatever unfolds out of the story, it could be something really quirky or it could be something really intelligent. It doesn't really matter at the end of the day, but it's like, it's a way to break the ice. It's the way to get people to engage and say, Hey, you know, if uh, Gabriel's here, he's the facilitator and, you know, he can actually, you know, show his true colors. You know, I'm ready to show my true colors as well. Mm -hmm. Then we start engaging in this dynamic that actually makes it easier, you know, to get to the topic, to the core of the element, to the core of the, the subject that we want to address. And at the end of the day, when we finish up a meeting, well, uh, people will leave knowing, you know, that they will have actually gave a, give a piece of themselves into that meeting. So there's this emotional connection to whatever outcome of that meeting. So storytelling for me, has always been around, you know, let's strip away all of this facades. Let's leave the titles on the side. Let's work together. Let's show, you know, our hearts here, what we're really about. And then we can actually address whatever topic it is. And it works very much in, for example, when we do innovation work and when we do the, the client journey process, when we, you know, we get into a client journey, the idea is to use empathy. It's to use, you know, all of these elements of design thinking but the empathy is really in the middle of it. It's like, put yourself in the shoes of that individual who, you know, has to go through a process to make a decision. Well, let's create a story around it. And then, you know, that's always the, the fun part. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to put the hat on of Smriti. And you know, Smriti, when she goes out and buys something, well, you know, how does she really mm. feel? You know, really, it's, mm. it's not about just making a sale. No, no, how does she really feel? Maybe at the end of the day, that's not what she wants. So there's a whole story that evolves from all of that. But it all starts with, really the heart, I, for me at least. And, and this is how I try to use it as much as possible in the environment where, where I work. You know, what's interesting is, of course, like we with Braindate work a lot in the event space. And uh, there was what I would say was a bit of a status quo in what was happening at events for a long time in person. Mm -hmm. You know, big conference centers, keynote speakers, people talking to you, but you were assembled in a city, staying in hotels, and it was kind of nice. You were captive at the very least to that space. Your calendars were open and now you're not, right? And so event organizers have to really reconsider what it is to host an event because it's so very easy. And I'm sure that people who are watching this live right now might also be, you know, looking at mm -hmm. Slack and so on. And, and, you know, it's almost impossible to avoid. And so the idea of story in our industry and what we're doing has become more and more important because if all you're doing is knowledge transmission in an event, yeah. you as a participant, as someone who would be fall within this idea of the audience could go find that information, read it, find some YouTube video and get the same. And so how do you craft something that is meaningful? that has some form of entry point and then takes an attendee on a journey. Mm -hmm. And I, I guess when my question to you, all four of you is that's you know, as a core idea, concept makes sense, but when you're doing it for hundreds or thousands or tens of thousands, you know, yes, you can think about personas, but how would you approach that challenge? You know, I know, uh, Actually, I'm kind of curious to think about how Lego Serious play, and maybe you can actually share what that is, because I don't yeah. know if everybody understands that, but <laughs> what is the core idea there, and, and is there something that you can speak to that, that um, might relate to these big events that are virtual, that are international, when you're dealing with all kinds of different people? Well, I, I think... Uh, I have to put you on the spot. <laughs> so, so it's interesting. I... I, I you know, I, I discovered Lego Serious Play, the methodology, uh, back in 2014. And the, the, and I'll, I'll tell you my story about that, okay? <laughs> so I was very uh, involved into strategic planning with organizations, pretty big organizations in the financial environment, in the corporate world. And so, you know, I would go about the normal process of, you know, working with the clients as a consultant to doing some, you know, strategic planning work that involved all kinds of, you know, analysis of the market, top-down analysis, bottom-up analysis, coming down with the matrix, the mix, you SWOT analysis, all the analysis words that you can think of, you know, as you, any consultant would go through it, right? And, then, and the work, I, I thought at the time, work was pretty good. 
And, and I would evaluate the success of the work when the client would actually be happy and start executing on, this, on a plan that they put together and that I had contributed to. But what started to happen, uh, and this started to happen in the, you know, I guess, late or early, no, mid, mid 2013, they started to come back to me and saying, you know, something's not working or, or there's just these plans would just come crashing down and they would have to revisit them. And they, they start re-questioning themselves and they weren't sure what was going on. And, and then, so, so obviously I would get involved again. I says, well, it's pretty cool for a consultant to, you know, be called back and update a strategic plan. But the thing is, is that it's always being like that. And so I started to question myself. I really started to question, okay, I, something's wrong with my way of doing the business and in developing a strategic plan here. I really got to go back to school. And I was actually thinking of going, you know, getting an MBA of some sort, you know? And I said to myself, I, I don't know, something in the model itself doesn't stick until one of those days I get a newsletter from some organization in Silicon Valley, and they're talking about them using Lego bricks you know, to do their strategic planning, using Lego bricks to do, you know, innovation work, Lego bricks to problem solve. And that caught my attention right away. So I got, and I did a little bit of research. I got involved right away. I spoke to the, one of the founders of Lego Series Play, who happens to actually be based in Denmark. And I knew he was, and I, and I discovered he was giving a class and I decided, okay, well, I'm ready to go take a class here. I, I'm ready to get certified. You know, it's a four day intensive, really intensive. And Marcy can speak to that. And uh, so he told me, well, you got to wait uh, until there's one session that's around, you know, where you live, which is in North America. And I said, no, I can't wait. So I, I flew directly to Denmark in the space of a, you know, a week's time making that decision. I went to Denmark and got the training right there. Now, one of the things that I discovered from the get go is that Lego series play is a methodology that helps you think, communicate, and resolve problems, problem solve. And one of the things that is powerful about it is that is there's a science behind it, is that by actually bringing your hands together and start touching bricks, uh, all of a sudden you're activating the part of the brain that normally is asleep when you're just in, interacting like we're interacting today, which is mm -hmm. the right hemisphere of the brain. In the right hemisphere of the brain, we keep forgetting that this is where we get all of our inspirations. This is where we get all of the beautiful golden nuggets of stories that emerge. And so when you're doing a, a normal strategic planning session, people are just thinking and they're analyzing and they're just using left brain. So it's, it's, mm -hmm. it, and it can actually be very interesting and very enriching but necessarily, it doesn't connect to, to the true core of what is happening. And I'll make that link with that, with what was with not working with the strategic planning. So in a strategic planning session, we would do these workshops and everybody would actually analyze, start thinking. And it's all about, you know, what's the market size? What's the competition doing? doing you know, what is our strength? What is our weaknesses and stuff like that? But people weren't actually tapping into their ability to come up with some brilliant ideas and put it into play because it was all about analysis. And when the ideas did come out, what do you think happened? Well, all of a sudden somebody has a light bulb, but they have to communicate it. Here's what's happening when you truly communicate an idea the normal way, which is the verbal way. Well, depending on who's around in the, in the, in the room. So if I have my boss, if I have my peer here, if I have one or two, three directors, and there's one of them I don't feel 100% comfortable with, what happens is, I start taking the original idea, pass it on to the left brain, start analyzing how I'm about to communicate it. Mm -hmm. And as it actually comes out of your mouth and we verbalize it, the original light bulb is not actually communicated the original way. Mm -hmm. So all of a sudden you're like, wait a minute, I had this great idea, but communicating doesn't come out the right way. So it doesn't feel as great as it was. And that has an impact a lot in a working environment where people don't feel connected to the core of their idea. And what happens is they just go through a normal strategic planning process and they feel like, yeah, that's just another exercise. Yeah, it's good. I'll live with it. But at the end of the day, when it comes down to execute, they don't have an emotional connection to it. Mm -hmm. So in Lego Serious Play, it's really tied about, you know, connecting those two hemispheres so that you can connect to your heart. So you, whenever you tell a story 
that story is a heart connection is a story of the subconscious that's normally not there when you're just using your left hemisphere. So at the end of the day, this is one way, you know, Marcy and I, we use a lot is Lego series play as a way for them to let go of these facades and connect to the true core when you tell the story. I don't know if that helps in answering some of that question that you had. Uh, no, but you know, it makes me think about uh, a story of my own. <laughs> um, so Mary and I met because uh, we've worked together. Brain Date was at her event, uh, NTAC. Um, mm -hmm. And the first time we did it, we were in person. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and uh, I remember we were in, in the conference center and there was the keynote speaker or the intros. It wasn't a keynote speaker. And these kids who were probably 14, 15 got up and were uh, presenting a project that they had worked on because I... If I understand it correctly, New Tech Network, one of the things that they emphasize is project-based learning. Correct. Or self-directed. In some ways, mm -hmm. it's the Lego blocks, right? Mm -hmm. You're putting together uh, in order to learn. And the kids were talking about what they'd done. And it was both verbal, but with pictures and stuff. So I guess it is also in some ways showing maybe the piece of Lego that you've put together to communicate that idea. I was in tears. Like, I was <laughs> like, oh my God, this is... You know, but I'm in behind a room of 2,000 people, and it was so beautiful and empowering to see these adolescents be so engaged in what they're done. And, you know, if I think about like an audience member now in either a large event or a workshop and virtual. Also, that's where, like, how do you bring that tactile thing? How do you bring in the, I think, the right brain as opposed to that left brain so that the communication, um, is richer, is more, mm -hmm. you know, rooted in what it was originally. I wonder, I, actually, I'd love to hear your thoughts about this, Mary, yeah, well, because I did bring up the project. <laughs> <of learning. laughs> well, Gabriel and I met at the North American Lego Series Play Conference um, a couple of years ago now. And, um, and then when we uh, went virtual, we reconnected and started creating different doing different tests and pulling together different cohorts of other Lego serious play practitioners um, to see what could we do in the virtual space. And, um, and we, I don't know, what was it, Gabriel, like three different cohorts of experiments uh, in order to find the right fit. And we found that Lego serious play is still just as um, effective in the in the ways that Gabriel explained. It's still um, triggering your creative brain. It's still an awesome problem solving or or even problem viewing kind of tool. Um, As I see, you're the, holding a piece of Lego. <laughs> I am. I am. I am. I always have them here. I always have them here. Um, but the the challenge was how. We, yeah. Yeah. How do we? was how do we um, how did we do the combined building? How do we do the interaction kind of piece? Mm -hmm. And we found that to be a little more limited and the, that we had to get into tools that were much that were that were more complex than we wanted, given the simplicity of the tool, right? Mm -hmm. That we'd have to go to mural or Miro and and train up everybody and you know mm -hmm. sort of add that level of complexity and take us out of the fun and the ease and the natural progression of things uh, just didn't seem right. So we have, um, Gabriel and I actually run a mastermind program so that people are building individually, exploring their um, concerns and challenges, and then looking for creative solutions within the group all here on Zoom. So we have sort of bridged that. Of, to the best extent we think is possible. Mm -hmm. And I'll just tell a quick story that my attraction to Lego series play is because all of my team building and team development and communication work is all with play. And when I saw, I learned about Lego series play, I was like, oh my God, that's my thing. That's my <laughs> thing, it's play. Because I think people learn better and connect better when they're uh, having a good time <laughs> and they're having play. 
In in relation to play, and this is a question that I um I, I wanted to ask also in the beginning of the conversation. I'm really glad that like I'm able to bring it back without completely like <laughs> derailing us back to the beginning. Um, and this also kind of relates to uh, Gabriel, you talking about how you know like um, creating kind of like that space of vulnerability, um, telling stories, and Marcy, you you know you've talked about like the sense of play. My question for you know both of you, but also just to the group in general, is that how do you get people in the mindset to actually just play? It's I mean, and I ask because like it's it's hard. Like for me, I mean, oh. I'll admit it. Like it is very difficult for me in a professional setting to get in the mindset of play. You know, to like get kind of silly to just uh, you know like. To, to switch off like what like you know, sorry left brain right brain I always get confused like the to <laughs> switch uh-huh. off the logical part of my brain so that I can connect to my heart and that's the and it's also related to the question that I earlier wanted to ask Gabriel is that like how are you because it's one thing to tell stories to others um as someone you know like if you're leading an event even if it's like a group of like from 20 to a thousand people you're telling stories you you're already you're doing that because you're already comfortable with being vulnerable right and like you've you've made peace with that you're doing that how do you create a safe space uh where people can a feel comfortable to also share their own stories um but also play you know, I think the safe space is required for both of those things to play and to be vulnerable, because I think there's a bit of vulnerability required in play as well. Um, you, yeah. Do you want to address this, Marcy or Mary? Or should I address this? <laughs> well, I'll just I'll just share one. You know, the, the people that I work with, um, for the most part, are coaches and the folks that go out and work with the schools, you know, they're they're educators. I mean, that's where they, they came from the classroom and we'll often do, um, you know, our company would in the before times, we would get together at least once a year, sometimes twice a year for an all hands conference for all of us. And through, you know, you're dealing with, you know, big topics that that the organization is trying to work through and, and grapple with. And they will often ask our colleagues that were previously elementary school teachers to do sort of like these breaks in between. And they have like the most amazing tools that they just pull out of their experiences of being an elementary school teacher, because they are like, they have to be in that playful spirit and mindset to engage their students. You know, it's hard to get really serious all the time with a six-year-old, but you can certainly engage them in some sort of physical activity that connects their brain back and helps them sort of focus in again. And so I think about that and just their willingness, like just to pull those tools out. And then you look at the, the people that taught, you know, high school, secondary, and there it's a much different type of way that they engage in that. But um, I think there is something there, Smriti, about being vulnerable and that sense of play. And it's really hard to do adults. We just sort of lose touch with that. Yeah, it's, it's, I agree. Cause I'm working in the corporate world and, yeah. uh, and I gotta say it's, it's tough. Um, I think that you have to come at it with an assumption that they can handle it, you know, and that it's expected <laughs> and you've got to model it. Mm-hmm. Right. Mm-hmm. So if I, if I said, is it okay if I bring these toys or is it okay if we play this game? No, here's what we're going to do. We're going to play a game. You know, let's do some improv or let's, right. and, you, and you make it safe by, by not only modeling it, but bringing it in slowly. So you don't mm-hmm. drop people into the deep end. You, you just like letting their voices be heard. You, you start small and you build mm-hmm. until it's okay. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Were you going to add something, Gabriel? Yeah, I, I think, I think you, you, you both made, uh, you know, Mary Marcy a, a very good point. And, and it's interesting because um, I always, I always used to think about the same issue, uh, Smriti, which is how do you, how do you get people to open up and play and be vulnerable? And it's interesting because I do come from the corporate world. You know, I was a stuck up, you know, individual where, you know, gosh, this isn't, this is just for kids and I'm not going to get there and go there, you know? And, uh, and then we, we, we forget a, a fundamental element is, is, as Mary said, is that we tend to lose all of these, this innocence of, mm. and, 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 and the wonder as we grow up and, you know, especially when you start getting, you know, hitting the, 
the adolescence uh, level and, and the adolescence, depending on your background, you know, how you were you know, educated, how you were raised and everything has an impact, right? But that's, it's, it's exactly all these belief systems that we end up absorbing as we grow up that actually either, you know, makes us open to the idea of being, uh, you know, uh, vulnerable or that shuts us down. And so I think, it, I think to, to, then to Marcy's point, I think there's, there's a, a need, an, an, an inherent need for us as facilitators to always understand who do we have in front of us? Uh, because we can't just uh, throw it out just like that. And it, I agree, there's, there's a work that we need to come into an assumption that you know, we can, you know, they, they'll open up eventually, but some won't. And, and I was, I'm one of the first who have witnessed it, that Lego seriously is not for everyone. It literally isn't for everyone. The same thing that, you know, if you approach, I'm, and I'm guessing this, and, and, I, and I cannot speak out of experience, but I'm kind of guessing that same, same way when we approach certain, you know, uh, children uh, that have certain abilities and so, some that have less abilities, the way we, we choose to approach them will vary. And, and there are tools, there are tools to, to help, you know, you know, see that flower, you know, blossom. Uh, one of the things though I used to do uh, is when I got my certification with Lego Series Play, I, I, was, I was very bold and maybe a bit too bold. And I what I would do is when I would be meeting a new client for the first time or a prospect, I would walk in with my briefcase where my computer would be but I wouldn't have a computer there. I would have a couple of Lego sets in it. Mm -hmm. And then I'd sit down in the meeting and then I would just start to gauge the environment and see how they are. You know, I mean, this, if you see just a, a wall full of diplomas, um, you know, with all due respect, and you know, I, I respect that very much. Then I say to myself, hmm, is this a good time to pick out the, you know, the Legos and start you know, using it as an, as an interaction tool? And sometimes if I were in an environment of a startup that's in the music business, which happened many times, all of a sudden they were like, there's play everywhere. So I said, okay, well, you know, I'll pull out the Lego kids and this is going to be the way we're actually going to talk, speak. So I asked them, what's your issue, but build it for me, please. And they're like, what? Okay, well, let's, let's play. And it turns out it's easy. It's, it's easy to engage. How do you do it with 2000 people? That's a tough question. It's not an easy thing. Right, but there's a there's an element of preparation. There's for me there has to be an element of preparation. There has to be an element of you know who do we have in front of us as our audience, and when you are usually with a big audience, I think the biggest Lego series play workshop I've done was in front of 53 software designers, uh, and usually Lego series play is not meant to be in big group settings, but I did a two hour what I call agile problem solving or laser workshop with them. Because they were, because I knew that they were all young software developers, somehow I, I kind of knew that it would be easy for them to just buy into this and all of a sudden they would just fly with it. And that's exactly what happened. So when you know your audience, you can actually start looking at all the possibility tools that exist. And you know, Lego series plays just one tool out of thousands that people can use. I'm guessing that, you know, in, in Mary's case, in the education environment, there's so many rich tools that, they, you know, you can bring to the table. And it's, so it's, it's a question of understanding. But, you know, one of the things, though, that I connect, and I have to say, one way to truly understand who you have in front of them, for yourself, is storytelling. Mm -hmm. So you start with yourself. So, you know, let me tell you about me. Let me tell you about my story, why I'm here today. You know, and, and, and talk from the heart. So you have to lead by examples to open up the door, you know, and open up the, the gate so that people can start doing it themselves. But if you go in and you're just reserved and all about left brain thinking, how I'm going to actually pass the message, that's going to be a bit of a challenge. Mm -hmm. hmm. Yeah, it's... No, it's a good gift. I'm just, you know, it's, it's, to me, it's like you setting the stage, right? I, I, when we first moved to virtual, you know, as a company, it became clearer to me, and I felt this way before, was that event organizers or people who are bringing communities together have to not be or event organizers. They, they have to sort of take a mindset of a facilitator, right? Like, how do you create an environment, a situation where that kind of storytelling takes place and that learning takes place? 
And, you know, with a bit of a background in coaching, uh, one of the key things that you have to take care of is the interpersonal component, yeah. right? Like having a conversation, this is in itself a story. It's playful too. We're kind of mm-hmm. picking at each other's ideas, uh, sentences, sometimes interrupting, although we're doing pretty good. Uh, but, you know, it has to be engaging. There's no story there if it's just mono- monotonous and, and in one direction. Right. You know, you know I, I think that's, it's something I was thinking about as I was thinking about storytelling. I started thinking about questions, right? Mm-hmm. And question formation, because it takes two. And it kind of speaks a little bit, Gabe, Gabe to your thought, or it moves it a little bit. Um, I don't want to get off what you said, but that it's not just about telling the story. Um, and then there's listening to the story. And there's the questions that draw out the story, right? Mm-hmm. So the how might we mm-hmm. um, do yeah. that and, you know, create an event um, that, that, that encompasses, encompasses this or gives this feeling or the results that we want. And it, it's, it's, it's that openness to also hearing the story and being part of allowing other people to mm-hmm. tell it. And that's through your question or through just creating that opening. And so something that we try to keep in mind when we're designing, whether it's in person um, or virtual, and obviously this last year has honed our skills in that area, is designing for those at the margins. Mm. So there's an assumption that everybody comes into us with the same kind of feeling or comfort level. And when you when you design for those people in the middle, you are intentionally, unintentionally leaving out a whole group of people that maybe, whether very uncomfortable in a setting like this, or you know, they need something more than just a Zoom conversation. So we've tried to employ like some different types of things to engage people through not having, you know, sessions back to back to back, leading, leaving lots of time in between, you know, during our conference, giving them resources and materials to go and engage in, creating Slack channels for them to communicate and talk to and connect off screen um, and allowing them to turn their cameras off, to get up and walk away, doing some things by, you know, just audio and not um, always virtual video. But with, by thinking about those people at the very edges, then you're guaranteed to include everybody um, and have something for everybody. But it's not the easiest thing to do in a virtual space, for sure, you know, trying to touch on all of those different senses. And so getting really creative and sort of throwing out the rule book about what it means to set up an event and run something, um, whether it's virtual or in person, I can't wait to get back to designing something in person and seeing what we can come up with now that we've like thrown out like how we've done things before, you know. So, yeah, actually, I, that's yeah. <laughs> just one sentence that yeah, no uh, transition. Me. Now that we've learned how much to like how important <laughs> it is to design something very exciting on a virtual space, mm-hmm. when it's going to move into in person is going to be very interesting to see. <laughs> yes. Yeah. change what they were doing absolutely but in, yeah. relation, in relation to what you just said Gabe about like one of the things that we have learned in a virtual setting and I Mary you touched on this a bit is that uh you do need to kind of provide people with a lot of resources to mm-hmm. you know like and um and I loved what you said Gabriel about seeing the event planner more as a facilitator than a planner because I keep think I keep going back to the first question we asked you and it's like, how do we scale it? How do we scale storytelling? And just just kind of taking from the different strings that we've had in this conversation, what you said, Marcy, about like, you know, it's the it's the telling of the story, but then there are also the questions. So there is the, the process, there are techniques in the process. And what this makes me think of is that maybe the way to scale storytelling in event planning or like just, you know, like, not even event planning, but just like gatherings, you know, like whether, you know, they're in the space of like a corporate event or like if they're in the space of just workshops and stuff is not necessarily to think about it as like getting like 500 people to share their story or like be part of like one coherent story. It's to make sure that you as like the event planner or whoever is the organizer is 
empowering your speakers, you know, like the people who are doing this facilitation work, who are working with participants with the skills of storytelling, you know, because I think that um, so many events, like it's you, you go to an event, you attend sessions and, you know, and there is a lot right now in the event industry, a lot of the conversation on virtual has been like, you need to train your speakers. Um, but the training mm -hmm. is always around the fact of like, well, here's how you make your con with, you know, your, here's how you deal with it. Like technically, like this is where yeah. you should be, um, you know, like this is the type of light you should have. Uh, and I think that like maybe some event organizers will also train their speakers to, you know, give them basic uh, presentation skills. But I don't think that a lot of them are necessarily training them in like, how do you tell a story? Or like at the end of your presentation, as you said, Marcy, how do you ask the, the questions that will actually get your audience to start thinking about your content. And so I think that maybe that is the way to scale storytelling is to like collab, like have collaborative learning sessions with your entire event team, but also the participants who are coming and like the speakers uh, and sharing those skills so that you can kind of do it in small groups. Because I agree with you, Gabriel, like, it has to be, I think you have to understand who the person is in front of you to have, uh, I think, to tailor the way that you communicate to have maximum amount of impact, but that inherently means that it needs to be personalized and that needs to happen at a much smaller scale. You can't be personalized as, you know, on, with 6,000 people at the same time, you just, you can't. Um, and so, I don't know, that's the, sorry, that's the thought that I had. Mm -hmm. I had like an aha mm -hmm. moment and I was like, is this, did, did we just solve this? Like, <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> but. I think it's interesting <laughs> what you just mentioned, Sriti, because uh, we, we always question, you know, how do we scale this? How do we scale this, right? Mm -hmm. and, uh, and I, I, don't, I don't think there is a one answer that fits all, right? But I think also it's the same thing about storytelling. I mean, you know, communication as, uh, in and of itself is an art. And there are many ways to communicate. And, but we tend to forget that when uh, children grow up and they start communicating, we just let them communicate the way they, best way they can, right? And then we just... Uh, it's, it's our you know, responsibility to say, what is that child trying to tell me, you know? And so, so there's, it, it's, it's, it is the give and take, it's a balance. And, and, but yeah, there, I think that, I don't have an answer to that, but I think that as we continue to explore uh, storytelling, especially from my perspective, I think new ways of communicating will evolve, will, will emerge and evolve. And, and I think that's really something that I'm looking forward to it, but it's, it's definitely going to be, you know, where we're heading in the future, where how do we actually, you know, communicate on a grand scale in such a way that people actually feel hundred percent who they are and they, they don't have to wear some kind of a, a hat or mm -hmm. a facade to be able to communicate. And that's the collaboration aspect too, right? Like it's, you're not communicating unless there's like a, a, you know, someone listening and someone nodding their head or shaking their head or, and, and those are the little moments that somehow you want to bring in, you know. Um, we have uh, some questions. So we're going to move to that because I also want to give us a bit of time for takeaways, although I feel like we can continue on and on. Um, but so someone is asking, what are some tips to become a better storyteller? Mm. <laughs> I, I, I can I can venture to answer that. Okay. And and this is a this is one that is not easy, but uh, it's actually something that I've put into practice uh, occasionally. Is to start telling stories to yourself. What is it that you'd like to accomplish today in a story form? Hmm. And and, and uh, I learned this from a from a, a, a gentleman that I, I admire quite well, uh, Christopher Avery, and he's. He heads a, a responsibility process, and it's it's a great leadership uh, a gift. And he he used to say when when he woke up in the morning, the first thing he would say is, "Today uh, I am, am embracing my whole self, uh, Gabriel Youssef, as I am, and 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 I have all of the right to make mistakes and you know start telling stories that way, right? So." He, every time he'd wake up in the morning, he would wake up with the idea that, hey, 
today I choose to be the greatest version of myself. And then all of a sudden, when you start waking up and you start opening up the doors to such a concept, uh, you, everything that emerges during the course of the day becomes a story in and of itself. So start telling stories to yourself, I keep saying, you know, and, and see what happens, experiment, you know? Yeah, it was, um, yeah, yeah I, I love that, Gabriel. And also that you, um, yeah, you have to practice. I think you really have to practice. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So you don't just tell somebody something, you tell them in a story, mm -hmm. you know, make a point of telling a story so that it allows for that kind of connection interchange. I think it's part of it's also in the setup and getting the details mm -hmm. and, you know, trying to paint the picture with your words as you're, as you're talking about whatever it happens to be. I mean, I, I, you know, whether you're sitting with your partner at the end of the day and you want to tell them about your day instead of just like, this is what happened in a repeat of the events, like paint the picture. What was the person wearing? How are they sitting? What was the mood like, the feeling? I think you, you practice that in just telling those stories of just normal everyday things and you get better at being able to craft it and then to be able to drive to the point that you're trying to make. Um, in scene, well. I think there's something, Mary, right? There's in scene and right. there, there's facts and then there's in scene. So mm -hmm. you want to pull people into the scene. Mm -hmm. And then one day, you know, right. or, or then this happened, you know, so you build texture um, right. so that you're in scene, not just tell it, looking at it from outside. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah definitely. Another question is how does uh, storytelling relate to learning? Uh, it, it helps you to connect to the to to the to the issue that you're talking about, you know, first. So I can tell you um, we're going to learn about um, how these two pieces fit together. Or I can tell you a story about how not having these fit together was a real problem for somebody. And then I can tell you a story of how when they were able to figure out how they fit together, you know, their life changed. And now you you have a different sense about learning. And now and then I can show you how to do it and help you to do it. And then you tell your own story. How was it when you put those two pieces together? I mean, it's a silly example, but mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. see how the story made it richer. Mm -hmm. I was um, thinking about my, my, my dad um, was... Uh, at Pearl Harbor during the bombing of Pearl Harbor. Um, he was in the Navy. And um, when I was studying, obviously in, in high school, you know, studying about World War II and learning about Pearl Harbor, you know, I, of course I asked him about his experience. Um, and he didn't tell me a whole lot about it because it was such a painful experience. But some years later, he was interviewed to tell his full story of, of that day. And I have an audio, you know, I have a recording of that. And when I was able to listen to it, his full story made the history that I had learned so much richer and deeper. And I could make so many more connections to it because of that personal story. Of course, it was my dad. So it was even more personal. But I think you can take facts and if you can connect a story to it and you can connect to that story and that person, then those facts become something that are much more tangible and real for you. And it's easier to learn, absorb and retain in that way. So. Oh yeah, the retaining is huge, right? Mm -hmm. The oh, yeah. people talk about the forgetful curve, and within like an hour of a presentation, which is very passive experience, you forget something like fifty percent. Within a week, you've forgotten ninety mm -hmm. percent. You know, how do you make use of the information that's coming in? First of all, if it's a story, there are a lot many you know more connections that are taking place within the brain as to how you're categorizing the information mm -hmm. and remembering it. But that's also the power of conversation, right? If you can have a conversation. Right. It itself is like anchoring, right? You, I think you said problem, solution, anchor, Marcy, earlier, which mm -hmm. I noted because I like those, that sort of order. But the anchoring of an experience uh, is important. Mm -hmm. And how, how do you make that engaging for people? And like one of the, you know, things, as I mentioned earlier, you know, the coaching background and, and thing is like, how do you bring the interpersonal component in it? And there was a question, and I don't really know if you have the time, but maybe Gabriel, I'll let you do it before we take some takeaways is you're talking about getting up and telling a story. Like, how do you make that not be just also prescriptive to yourself, but authentic? 
Mm-hmm. Right? Like, how do we keep that tell- storytelling authentic to ourselves and, and then to others, of course, because that, I think, follows. Wow, that's a very good question. <laughs> and I think we can spend another two hours on that. <laughs> but, so maybe we'll keep it for another conversation. Yeah, this is, <laughs> this is truly a, 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 a space where uh, you it's how connected you are to yourself, really. I mean, we're going to start getting into an area where how, you know, how happy are you within with yourself and, you know, how much do you want to embrace change and how much there's so much depth into that question that, you know, really, honestly, it's, it's really about, you know, who you choose to show up, how do you choose to show up, you know, during the day and who do you choose to be during that day and connect it to your true self and, and not just your ego. So I can, I can spend two, three hours just talking about that based on my personal experience, but it's really about, it, it's, it's exactly what you said. You cannot make this, you cannot force that issue. You cannot, you know, decide that this is how I'm going to be today. And, you know, every morning I will time myself. I will put a reminder that it just won't work. At least from my experience, it wouldn't work. It really has to deal with, you know, who you really want to be and show up during the day and connect to that heart, right? It's, it's, not, about, it's not about just thinking. It's about really connecting to the true self. And if I, if I may venture, Gabe, really quickly, because I, I have like a little trick to actually do that, that I, I tell the storytellers that I work with, because uh, I, by day I work with um, E180, but by night and all of my other free time, I actually work with a lot of storytellers um, mm-hmm. in a storytelling series that's based in Montreal. And something that I always tell uh, kind of the students that I will teach in my workshops is the trick to, at least for the one single story, uh, is, con- is emotion. So if you're not able to connect to your whole self, because it is that is a high order, it is difficult to do, especially if you're not someone who's naturally very self-effective, which a lot of people are not, um, is to focus on that one emotion. And I think that that also translates into making you a fantastic storyteller, because if you can figure out what is that one emotion that you want your audience to feel, then tapping into that one emotion within yourself is mm-hmm. a lot easier, I find, because mm-hmm. um, you can evoke memories, and it, it also becomes like a little, like a like a back door into your <laughs> authentic self, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, so, but uh, I will I will stop now because I know we have <laughs> we have to do takeaways, <laughs> but I had to jump in. I just love this topic so much. Mm. Yeah, so maybe if we can take like 30 to 45 seconds, maybe up to a minute at very most to just what is a takeaway from this conversation? Mm. Wow, there's so many. Yes. There's so many. You know, I, I just love collaborative, the whole collaborative learning piece. You know, I just, I just love that. It, I'm a verbal processor. So I have to like talk about everything <laughs> and, um, to, uh, to, to just work through something. And um, uh, yeah, and, and so I think that's part of, you know, tapping into storytelling and t- tapping into listening also to other people's stories. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. It's important for engagement and for connection and, um, and yeah, and I love that finding your authentic uh, emotion. Oh, that's, nice. that's nice. I don't know if that's a takeaway, but it's just thoughts. Thoughts in my head. <laughs> I think for me, it's reinforced my belief in, in tending to the whole person that's attending whatever event you're putting on or whatever you're designing, whether it's a conversation or a training to really meet them where they are and offer and offer them a, a space to, to share a little bit more about themselves as a way for that more authentic connection and vulnerability and storytelling. It just, you know, it's something that, you know, like I intrinsically know that, but to then talk about it and hear others talk about it in their lines of work, it just reinforces it for me that that's, that's powerful and that we need to keep doing that kind of thing. And as we move into in person that I just wonder if, if there will be some awkwardness there and how do we start to get comfortable <laughs> being in spaces again with people, you know, after being a year of this kind of thing. So mm. stay tuned. <laughs> <There'll be more laughs> <of that. laughs> yeah. Wow. That's great. My, my, my takeaways are, are many. I think it's, it's, 
you know, I, I picked up all of those buzzword, empathy, connection, you know, uh, shared history. I really like that notion of shared history. We tend to forget that we all have a background in history. And, and all the idea around, you know, again, to Mary's point, reinforcing the idea that it, it's all about who's in front of you too, you know, and, and respecting that space. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think the the idea of speaking to sort of like the whole self, that's sort of like a holistic approach mm-hmm. to design. Mm-hmm. And I think it's it's hard because, you know, we do what Gabriel, you were talking about earlier of using our left brain, very analytical self to design. But I guess maybe one takeaway is like Lego plays one way, but how do you bring in that playfulness that mm-hmm. is using a different side of the brain so that you are more intentional with designing for the whole self and the whole self is not just cognitive. It's, it's moral, it's spiritual, it's Mm -hmm. interpersonal, it's emotional. It's all these things, right? It's somatic. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, You get to back it up. (laughs) I know. He's the closer. Yeah, no, I, and I think I have a, I think I have a a whole, uh, a good closer because when we first came up with this topic, <laughs> it's because, you know, I mean, we work, um, we work primarily with the industry, event industry, right? And so when we first came up with this topic, I was on board 100% for the storytelling part of it, but I was having a really hard time kind of uh, making a connection between storytelling and events. Because I, I know that like in events, like one very obvious way to use storytelling is like, this is how you give better keynote speeches. And like, this is how you give better like uh, presentations during like all the speaker sessions. And, uh, but I was really wondering like, how can we uh, go beyond that? And so I think that for me, the biggest takeaway of this conversation has that it's it's not just about, you know, it's about the two-way relationship that you said, Gabriel, right? Is that like, it's not when event planners or people like our, you know, our clients who are working with, when they're thinking about storytelling, it's not just an engaging means of uh, transmitting knowledge, but it is a philosophy and an approach to design that is very human centric. Uh, and if we can kind of move into the future with that human centric approach, uh, we will be able to design experiences that are truly transformational. Uh, mm-hmm. And I think we can do it because uh, we have really great facilitators and people with all of this knowledge. And I'm very excited to <laughs> explore Lego series play because I didn't know anything about it before this conversation. But, but yeah. Wow. That was a perfect <laughs> way to end. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> I was thinking well about done. It. Well done. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I would love to uh, just want to thank you so much for joining us and uh, making this conversation really, really stimulating. I was we were just Smriti and I was speaking about earlier this week and we knew it was going to be this way and I wish we had uh, more time but um, oh, yeah. maybe there will be an opportunity to pursue this in, in another uh, way. well thank, thank you for having us yeah um, thanks for the you. opportunity yeah, for sure great. it's great meeting you uh, Mary this and Gabe yeah. thank nice you meeting again. you all too <laughs> thank yes. you so much have thank a great thanks weekend thanks so much all right bye 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 everybody take care bye everyone Bye-bye. bye